Hey there, nation, and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Chiefsgate, and we are back another episode of Way of the Underhive. This series is dedicated to helping brand new players to Nicaragua build their starting rosters and learn more about the game mechanics of their favorite gangs. And on today's episode, we'll discuss playing a chaos corrupted house gang in the Aranthian Succession. We will discuss the positive and negative aspects of playing in the Aranthian Succession, the impact that the campaign setting has on Chaos Corrupted House Gangs, discuss potential alliances, brutes, hangarons, as well as hired guns for your gang. We'll also provide you a 2,400 point starting roster that you can use in your very first campaign. And then as an added bonus, we'll also talk about how you can play this gang on the tabletop by reviewing tabletop tactics, as well as talk about how this gang can develop as the campaign progresses. Now, because this video is a little bit more of a deeper dive, I will put timestamps in the description box down below. That way you can click and navigate to the part of the video that interests you the most. So before we start talking about this video, let's start with a couple of questions. Why should you play a Chaos Corrupted House Gang? The reason why is because you want the best of both worlds. You want to have a house gang, but also have some really interesting and unique gameplay as well as challenges that are unique specifically to those gangs that are corrupted by Chaos. And lastly, you're playing Chaos. That's all that needs to be said about that. So that being said, let's go ahead and talk about what kind of positive as well as negative effects that are involved with playing the Arathian Succession. So first of all, let's talk about the positives of playing in the Arathian Succession campaign setting. You start off with anywhere between 2,000 to 2,400 credits to create your gang. Uh, if you're staying in the Underhive, you only get 2,000 credits, but if you're venturing out to the Ashway, so you have 2,400. Now the nice thing about this is because you have a larger starting credit allowance, that means you can also create some really interesting and unique gangs as well. At the same time, you're also allowed to double the number of champions that you can have in a gang. Typically speaking, you can start off with anywhere between two to three champions in a gang when you create your roster, but with the Aranthe Success, you can actually double that number to anywhere between four to six, depending on which gang you're playing specifically. Now, when a lot of new players, when they see this brand new uh, increase in champions as well as starting credits, a lot of them actually get quite hesitant, believing that what they have to do is double the amount of fighters that they usually start off with in a starting gang. So a lot of new players will try to get like anywhere between 20 to 25 miniatures put together in order to fulfill that higher requirement. However, that's actually the wrong way of going about it. Instead, what you want to do is go what I like to call a quality of build rather than a quantity. What you want to do instead of getting 20 to 25 fighters, maybe start off with anywhere between 10, maybe at the most 15 fighters, and fully equip those fighters with everything they need to be to be successful on the tabletop. So give them really good weaponry, give them amazing armor saves with better armor, give them war gear that you would not usually start off with at the beginning of a campaign, things like photo goggles and respirators, for example. You could even go so far as to get a either really good brute or a hanger on of some sort to start off your gang with or better yet get exotic beasts it's really much up to you so because that you can create a really good variety of different gang lists based on these new starting requirements which is always a kind of a cool thing to see on the tabletop now that said, there are a few negatives of playing in the Aranthus Succession campaign setting. One of those, of course, is going to be the balance bandwagon. A lot of balance bandwagon people are going to be really upset with the brand new amount of starting credits you have. They think that you might actually abuse that and also create really powerful gangs. I'm not sure why this would be an issue because your component can do exactly the same thing as well. So whatever that case may be, if they get really upset about it, be immature about it, just ignore them and tell them to play or don't, you know, bother. And also, another thing you have to worry about too is that the Aranthus Succession is very narrative heavy. So if you're not not really much into narrative gameplay this might not be your uh, interest for you uh, just because of all the narrative involved with it however if you're really into narrative gameplay or you're looking for some cool ways to start off a campaign with a larger credit allowance then the Aranthus Succession is perfect for you so now that we're done talking about the negative and positive aspects of playing in the Aranthus Succession let's go and talk about exactly how chaos corrupted house gangs are specifically impacted by this campaign setting so like I mentioned before, when you play a Chaos Corrupted House Gang, you actually get the best of both worlds. Not only do you have all the rules as well as all the weapons, equipment, and the narrative of the house that you're playing in any one of the six starting houses in Necromunda, but at the same time though, you also have access to the Chaos Powers as well. And there are some benefits and drawbacks due to this. One of the big ones, of course, is that you have a really big impact on lasting injuries. So instead of actually suffering lasting injuries, you could actually roll up and actually get what's known as mutations instead. Now there are some really good positive 
and negative effects caused by these mutations. If you want some more information about that, I suggest you check out the Book of Ruin for more uh, in-depth information about that. But it could make some really cool and interesting gameplay mechanics based on those mutations. Another thing you also have access to, of course, is the Dark Ritual post-action that you can take with your gang. Basically, what you do is, depending on the various factors involved of whether you won or lost the battle, you roll a pair of dice, and based on the numbers you roll, either you get the benefit of a Chaos God that is going to give you some boons to your gang, or you has the opposite effect and actually one of your fighters ends up becoming a chaos spawn instead which is also kind of interesting as well so either way you're winning either way because either you're getting improvements for your gang or you're getting a really good powerful brute that you can also include in your gang as well so like I said, having this ability to be immune to insanity is also really nice as well. What that means is that, of course, is that if you decide to actually have to face anything that causes insanity for your gang, you're automatically immune to it. I guess being exposed to all that chaos, eldritch power uh, kind of numbs your fighters to those kind of things. And like I mentioned before, when it comes to the chaos spawn, these are really powerful brutes. The, now the stats for these uh, creatures are random, so you don't really get to choose what the stats are for it. But with that being said, though, you have a really powerful creature that is really good at close combat as well. So that's something to keep in mind too now at the same time like i said before you also got some really good boons depending on which chaos god that you also uh, follow as well for example if you follow in the blood god for example your leader gets an additional attack uh, just small little things like that that can really spice things up and of course we have our four different chaos gods in the situation we have corn which is known as the blood god in necromunda uh, nurgle which is the plague lord in necromunda the dark prince with his slanesh as well as the architect of faith which is of course uh, Zneech. So depending on what kind of gameplay you want to go with, uh, you can uh, take a look at the very specific benefits you get from each Chaos God, and of course plan accordingly to decide what kind of God you want to follow in your gang. So now that we're done talking about how the Chaos Corrupted House Gangs are impacted, let's talk about Alliances. Now when it comes to the alliances, of course, all every single house gang does have strong alliances with either a merchant guild, a criminal organization, or a noble house of some sort. So that still actually applies to your gang as a house gang, except for one. You will not be allowed to take any guild uh, alliances, and the reason why is because when you become a chaos corrupted gang, you're automatically outlawed. So because of that, if you want to maintain those strong alliance connections, you can only choose from criminal organizations or noble houses. And the reason why is because criminal organizations don't mind if you're an outlaw, and neither do the noble houses so when it comes to that what you want to do is you want to use your alliance to shore up any weaknesses that you might have for example if income generation might be a problem for you you might want to make an alliance with the fallen house for example uh, for an outlaw uh, alliance with the criminal organization or maybe house of lanti if you're looking for that or for example if you have really bad fire quality like maybe your fighters aren't that great probably make an alliance that does have good fighters or for example range combat or close combat for example whatever weakness that your gang actually has you can short up by using the, the appropriate alliance to help you out. Now, like I said before, if you are a house corrupted outcast, uh, house corrupted, chaos corrupted gang, you do have those strong alliances. So making those strong alliances might be a little bit better for you. So that way, if in case you do have the test alliance, it won't be so detrimental. But at the same time, you could choose any noble house or criminalization that basically you fancy for that one. So now that we're done talking about the alliances, let's talk about brutes, hanger, uh, hangers on, as well as hired guns. So when it comes to Brutes, Hanger-Ons, as well as Hired Guns, the Rogue Doc is probably the best one for obvious reasons. If any one of your fighters rolls a critical injury, a lasting injury, the Rogue Doc is worth their weight in gold and patching you guys up. Uh, if you put them on the tabletop, they also have access to the Medicaid and Medicaid uh, kit, which is a lifesaver now, especially with the new rules update. So this person is actually worth their weight in gold. They're only 50 credits as well, so they're relatively inexpensive. Now, because you are a Chaos Corrupted House Gang, that means you also get access to house-specific hanger-ons as well as brutes. So if you want to get access to those things, that is something you could actually use with your gang. At the same time, because you're also a criminal uh, outlaw of status because of your Chaos Corruption, you could also hire outlaw hired guns as well as outlaw brutes. And this is what I was talking about when it talks about uh, getting the best of both worlds. You get the great hanger-ons and brutes access that you usually get with your house gang, and at the same time, uh, have access to the outlaw ones as well. So before you even make a decision, decide which house you want to play from, decide if you want to take Chaos Corrupt or not, and of course, plan accordingly. So in this video, what we're going to do next is we're going to go to our next starting roster for an example, which you could create with a Chaos Corrupted House Gang in the Aranthia Succession. 
So on our video roster for today, I like to call this list Dr. Drybrush's Brotherhood of the Dying Light. Now this is a house uh, crawler game that has been corrupted, and this will be the starting roster for your Nicaragua Aranthus Session campaign set in 2024. Dr. Drybrush is a fellow YouTuber here on the uh, on the platform. I highly suggest you check out his stuff because a really cool job with some creating some narrative type videos, and also there's a lot of cool uh, uh, community events as well. Now this is going to be a house crawler game that's declared to the Plague Lord. So because of that you will also have to choose a path to follow for your articles of faith in this case we're going to use the path of doom for this one now the benefits you get from following the plague lord is that once per end phase you can re-roll a single recovery roll uh, for any one of your fighters i would usually use that for your leaders champions or important fighters like your gangers for example at the same time you have any chaos spawn in your gang they get plus one added to their toughness and you also get plus one wounds characteristic for your gang leader as well your leader for this one's going to be a cador word keeper it's going to cost you 205 credits this fighter will be your leader. It's equipped with mesh armor as well as gutter forge cloaks. So that way they have a five up, uh, sorry, four up armor save with a five up board save against environmental effects. They have a Cawdor pole arm blunderbuss combo with a grape shot as well as purgation shot as well as photo goggles so they can see in the dark. You're going to give this person the overseer skill so that way they can use that to uh, use that for great effect on the rest of their gang. They have the pious special rule as well as the path that we follow, which is going to be the path of the doomed for this gang. And you also get additional wound characteristic for your leader, which means that this fighter has three wounds now. Now, Caldor Firebrand number one is going to cost you 290 credits. This carrier is going to be one of your champions. They're also going to be equipped with mesh armor and gutter forge cloak for that four up armor save as well as five up ward save for against environmental effects. This fighter is also packing the Caldor heavy crossbow with frag and crack shells and a stub gun with dum dum rounds for a backup weapon. They're also carrying photo goggles so they can see in the dark. They're going to give it the parry skill just in case they get charged in close combat. They can defend themselves. And once again, they have the pious as well as the righteous warrior special rule. Now you'll have another firebrand, fighter brand number two is going to cost you 210 credits. This fire is going to be another champion with mesh armor, a gutter forge cloak, as well as a master crafted great sword for that beautiful sever special rule, as well as a stub gun with photo goggles. You give them rain of blows so that way they can fight twice within one inch of their enemies because the versatile trait of their great sword. They also have the pious as well as righteous warrior special rule as well. You're going to have a third Cotter Firebrand for 260 credits. This character is going to be another champion with mesh armor as well as a gutter forge cloak. They're armed with a Cotter Pole Arm Blender bus with grape and purgation shot as well as blasting charges and photo goggles and the reason why i'm giving this fighter blasting charges is because they're gonna have bomb delivery rats so they can get that nice five inch blast template with those blasting char charges you give this fighter the skill rate of blows so that way they could take full advantage of their versatile trade their weapons and make their fighting actions simple actions and they're also gonna have the pious as well as righteous warrior special rules and the last Caldor, champ, Caldor Firebrand is going to be Firebrand number 4, it's going to cost 245 credits. This is your last champion with mesh armor as well as a gutter forge cloak. They're also packing a Caldor pole arm with blunderbuss, which has grape as well as brigation shot, as well as photo goggles. They're riding a Wasteland Oyster's dirt bike, as well as the random blow skills, so that way they can take full advantage of their versatile trailer weapon. They also got the pious as well as the righteous warrior special rules. Now your first brethren is going to cost you 145 credits. This is going to be a fighter with flak armor and a gutter forge cloak for a 5 up armor save with a 5 up ward save against environmental effects. They're packing a long rifle as well as a stub gun with dumped rounds for a backup weapon. You're also giving them photo goggles so they can see in the dark as well as a specialist skill because they can use that long rifle. They have the pious as well as the devout masses special rule as well. Then you have two more brethren, brethren 2 and 3. They're both equipped exactly the same at 195 credits apiece. Both will have flak armor as well as gutter forge cloaks. Cold or pole arms with blitter buses with grape and purgation shot, photo goggles, Wester Wester's dirt bikes so they can drive around on that, and they have the pious as well as the devout masses special rule attached to them. And then of course you'll have four Cordor bone pickers. All four will be equipped exactly the same at 30 credits apiece. All four will have twin stub guns as well as the fast learner, pious as well as the devout masses special rule. And then you also have a driver. You'll have a Calder Road Preacher. It's going to cost you 465 credits. This character's got photo goggles as well as driving a rock grinder with a weapon stash. So that way you can help out with any reloads. As well as escape hatches to protect your crew members in case when they're mounted on the vehicle. Tire claws for plus one handling. A redundant drive system in case your engine gets shot at with anything more than a glancing hit. As well as an engine shell uh, to protect your engine as well as your, your wheels. And a twin linked auto cannon because that thing is beast mode when it causes all kinds of damage. And then lastly, you're going to have a hanger on in this gang. And instead of doing a road dock this time around, you're going to take a Hive Preacher instead. It's going to cost you 70 credits. This fighter's got the two-handed hammer as well as inspirational skill. They also got the sermon, which is why you're taking them, which means you get D6 uh, faith dice at the beginning of every battle because that's what he brings to your group. He does have part of the crew special rule, which means you can put him in the combat if you want to. And this fighter's also an outlaw as well. 
Now, for your alliance on this one, you're gonna make a noble house alliance with House Co Iron. The benefits to this, of course, is that the noble intrigues special rule means that they will make an alliance with anybody, it doesn't matter if you're law abiding or outlaw, so it doesn't matter. And they automatically come with a strong alliance trait with House Caldor, so that's gonna really help you out as well. You also have the religious relics uh, a benefit, which means that you can choose a weapon or armor carried by the gang's leader, and that item is blessed, and once per battle, they may roll a single fail to hit roll or save. I would say I would use that for your leader's polearm and use that for close combat if they need to. You also have access to the Munistorium delegation, which means that the Munistorium delegation must be included in your gang if you're facing an enemy fighter with a gang, higher gang rating. Otherwise, you have the testing alliance. And you also have the Emperor Protects benefit, which means that the delegation members may reroll cool tests of double ones for all rally as well as nerve tests as well. Now, there are some drawbacks. The first one's called Penance of the Unworthy. I mean, if your gang loses a battle, the leader must start the next battle with a flesh wound. Otherwise, you have to test the alliance and you also have tied to the Frateris militia which means you must either choose either a random ganger or juvie and roll on the lasting injury table now if they roll a critical injury or memorable death then that fighter is instantly killed otherwise earn d6 experience now if they do go into recovery because of a lasting injury they suffer they will miss out that next battle and if they're killed the gang is compensated for the fighter's cost otherwise you have to test the alliance now the house kawaii ministerium delegation consists of three fighters you have your prima materas who's got a light carapace armor as well as a mastercrafted bolt pistol, which is nice, as well as a shock stave for close combat, and a refractor field for a 5-up armor save. And at the same time, she also has the inspirational leader skill, as well as devotional frenzy skill, as well as the overseer skill. And then you have two Frateras bodyguards, both work with mesh armor, as well as with eviscerators, which are great because you got that huge versatile attack chainsaw with a flamer on the bottom, as well as a last pistol for shooting, and they also have the devotional frenzy skill as well. And that will make up your starting roster for Dr. Drybrush's Brotherhood of the, of the Dying Light. And this is one that's dedicated to you, Dr. Drybrush, if you're watching this. So let's talk about the tabletop tactics for this gang and how this will help you on the tabletop. Now, the first thing we got to remember is that you're going to be using deployment shenanigans with this Gliss. And the reason why is because Calder can always take advantage of outnumbering your enemies in every battle due to Devout Mass's special rule. For your gangers, you will always gain one additional ganger regardless of the starting number required for the scenario. So keep that in mind. And for juvies, you will always, always have plus D3 juvies regardless of the starting number for the scenario as well. Which means you will always have at least plus two fighters on the table more than your opponent one ganger one juvie automatically potentially you can have up to four fighters which is one ganger and three juvies and because of this you will never need to deploy all of your fighters at all times because of that special rule now when it comes to playing in the battles that require the ashways what you're going to do is you're going to deploy the following fighters in the ashway scenarios you're going to have a word keeper a firebrand number one two three and four as well as your road preacher as well as brother number two and three followed by bone picker number one and then the house co-iron ministerium delegation so that way you have all 10 of your fighters on the tabletop if it requires 10 fighters of course now if you're going to deploy on fighters that do not in the ash waste which means you don't allow to have vehicles uh you'll still have your word keeper as well as fire brands one through four as well as brother number two and three but this time without their wasters dirt bike same thing with your fire brand with the wasters dirt bike they'll leave their stuff back at home as well as bone picker number one and two as well as coast house co-iron ministerium delegation to help you out now this is what's going to happen. You have a support fire team, which is always going to consist of your road preacher, as well as your word keeper, as well as firebrand number one and brother number one. Brother number one will always be on the table because of the devout mass special rule. Now assault fire team number one will consist of firebrand number four, as well as brother number two and three. These are the guys who are armed with the pole arms mounted on um, bikes. Assault fire team number two will consist of firebrand number two, as well as number three. Those are the guys armed with the great sword, as well as the bomb rats, as well as bone picker number one, as well as bone picker number two, because bone picker number two will always be there because of devout masses, because you're always going to lead roll at least one additional juvie. And then assault fire team number three will consist of the prima materas, as well as fraternis bodyguards number one and two from the delegation. And then lastly, if you have any leftover devout masses fighters, bone pickers number three and four will be on the sideline. However, if you do manage to roll those guys up with, then you'll add them to the assault fire team number two if you manage to roll those guys for your battle. Now, before the battle begins, remember to add D6 Faith Dice due to the High Preacher in the gang as well. You will also, at a minimum, have access to Brother Number 1 and as well as Bone Picker Number 2. And make sure you roll to see if you can feel the other two Bone Pickers just in case to get maximum uh, fighters on the tabletop. Now, in Ashway scenarios, the Support Fire Team as well as the Assault Fire Teams Number 2 and 3 will be mounted on the Road Preacher's Rock Grinder. Assault Fire Team will be deployed on the flank, whichever is the most advantageous for you. Now what you're going to do is you're going to close the distance to your enemy with the Rock Grinder using the Word Keeper's Overseer ability to either move the Rock Grinder multiple times 
or to fire his twin linked auto cannons multiple times. If you want to, you could also use the Word Keeper's Overseer ability on Firebrand number one and or Brother number one to get off two shots with their heavy crossbow or long rifle, whichever one's going to help you out the most. Now, once in range, Assault Fire Team number two and three will dismount from the vehicle and charge towards the enemy. Assault Fire Team number three will take point, lighting enemies on fire with their flamer attacks on their eviscerators, which hopefully will scatter your enemies with the blaze special rule. Now, Assault Fire Team number two will then assault through with the engager area, killing anyone that's in their path. Don't be shy with your bone pickers and using those human shields. After all, if they die, you can always recruit new ones as well. And don't forget, you also have access to bomb rats if you want to really cause some pain by making that bomb rat go out of distance and blowing up the blasting charge, which is always kind of fun as well. Now, while this is occurring, Assault Fire Team Number 1 will assault from the flank, blasting enemies with their template weapons and charging through with their pole arms as well, and mop up anybody who's left to be destroyed. Now, don't hesitate to use your Article of Faith as well in this game, because remember, you start off with D6 Faith dice at the beginning of the battle, and since you're allowed to uh, fall on the path of the doomed, don't hesitate to use your casualties, hopefully your casualties will be juvies in this case, and beat your threshold tests and either use suicide bombing or summon more fighters onto the tabletop, or make your opponent take a bottle test with your losses affecting their rules. Whatever shenanigans you want to use with that article of faith, just feel free to do so. And lastly, don't forget that your Plague Lord alignment, where you can reroll a single injury roll at each end phase. I would highly suggest you use this for your more fighter, valuable fighters like your, your leader, your four firebrands, or your gangers. So that is the tabletop tax that I recommend with this list. So let's talk about how this game will develop as the campaign progresses. As the campaign progresses, start with recruiting three more bone pickers, giving you a total of six of these guys in your gang. And you equip these three additional recruits the same way with twin stub guns. At 30 credits apiece, this is going to be really helping your gang to be able to summon more fighters on the tabletop with either devout masses or if you use the Path of Doom's Article of Faith ability and the people rose up and their multitude ate them, which allows you to add D3 additional fighters onto the tabletop as well. You can potentially have up to five extra fighters in terms of bump pickers on the tabletop causing problems for your enemy as well. Now what this will do is with those twin stub guns, they'll give them two shooting attacks each turn as well as additional close combat attacks as well, so keep that in mind. And if you really want to spurge, you can spend another 30 credits to equip all six of your bump pickers with dum dum rounds, giving them strength for shooting attacks as well as close combat attacks. So not too shabby for a grand total of what, 60 credits in total? That's actually quite good. Now if they should die, no problem, you can just recruit more of those guys to take their place. In addition, always use your bone pickers for the, the house co-iron drawback of tied to the Frateris Militia special rule, because after all, if your juvie dies, you can just recruit another one, so no harm, no foul. Now from there, you could purchase better armor for your leader, champions, and gangers. I would suggest purchasing armored undersuits that will really help out your leaders and champions, as well as mesh armors to help out your gangers. This way, your leader and champions will have a 3-plus armor save and a 5-plus ward save against environmental effects, and your gangers will have a 4-up armor save and a 5-up ward save against environmental effects. Now from there, you could purchase another heavy weapon uh, for your rock grinder, maybe a heavy flamer, for example, or upgrades or war gear for your rock grinder. I would start with dam damage mitigation upgrades, things like... Uh, uh, Things like uh, ablative armor to protect the outside of your vehicle, for example. You could also put a rock grinder ram if you want to as well, which would be kind of nice to ram your opponents. Or like I said, another heavy weapon like a heavy flamer would also be really cool for your gang too. And finally, I would suggest you recruit a rogue dog for your more important fighters. I would, I would actually ignore recruiting Way Brethren uh, or Brutes for this gang. And the reason why is because Way Brethren are only there when there's scenarios taking place in the Ash Waste. And if you're doing any scenarios that takes place in the Underhive, they will not be able to participate. So that's why I suggest just spending your credits on Wasters Dirt Bikes instead, because then those fighters can take uh, part in both types of scenarios. So that's the reason why I would do so. As for the Brutes, your house specific Brute, the Stick Shambler, is kind of cool, but I would actually just kind of shy away from it. For this gang, it's all about generating numbers, and that's what you want to do. After all, if you want a Brute, chances are you'll probably get a Chaos Spawn at some point in your gang's creation, so you could always use that for your Brute if you want to as well. And that is how I suggest this game would develop as the campaign continues. So in conclusion, you could create a wild variety of fighters in this list when it comes to the Ranthian Secession. This is by no means uh, the only list you can make with a house, uh, house Chaos Corrupted Gang in the Ranthian Secession. For example, you can make a really cool Escher Gang using Slanesh Special Rules if you want to, or maybe a Vansar Gang that's dedicated to this niche if you want, or whatever you want to do. It's incredible the number of variety you can create, especially with that starting value of 2,000 to 2,400 credits. You can make some really cool gangs that are fully equipped and vehicles that are fully upgraded, and it can be really amazing as well. And like always, like I said before, always make sure you go for a quality build rather than a quantity build. Um, now this one obviously is a quantity build because the game mechanics for House Cotter 
game kind of favors that, but you could do things like have a smaller group of guys and just spend a lot of credits making those guys fully equipped and really deadly as well. Uh, for example, you could really kit out a really tough 8-10 to 10 man Vansar gang with these rules, so that would be really interesting to see as well. Especially if you give them the Architect of Fate, so that way they can actually shoot their targets and all kinds of cool stuff. But as always, keep your eye out for more content about Nicomunda with the Amaranthus session as well. New things are coming down the pike all the time, and of course I will make videos accordingly in order to address those new materials that are coming down our way. So that's going to do it for this week, guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the greatest hobby news related to this channel. That's good news for this week, guys. I will catch you guys in the next one. Peace out and stay classy.